Good morning. Hi, I'm Joe Park, CEO of Horizon Stewardship, and with me today is Jeff Watson. Jeff is a practicing attorney, a recognized thought leader in lending, and skilled in lobbying in Washington and in his home state. He's a thought-after speaker, author of five books, and maybe most importantly, he deeply loves Jesus and the church. This is our third inter which, uh, interview with Jeff on the subject of PPP loans, and rarely does a day go by that I don't receive thanks from a church that the insights that he provided had had on their ability to secure this loan. Jeff, we thank you for being with us again today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's a privilege and it's an honor. Well, let's just jump right into it. Um, Jeff, the PPP loan funds ran out last Thursday, and we are hearing from hundreds of churches uh, that despite having applied, they were not able to get funding in the first allocation of funds. The media seems to believe that additional funds will be available just soon. I I've heard uh, this is uh, Monday morning. I've heard we could even have an announcement today. Jeff, you are very connected to this process. You get to kind of see behind the, uh, behind the walls and talk to the people that are literally working on this legislation. Um, what are your thoughts about when funds might be available? I'm going to predict before the end of this month, and here's why. If we're going to start with a gradual reopening, a soft opening in certain areas of this country in May, they're going to need the capital to start doing it. Okay. I think we're going to see some significant changes to the PPP program. I think we're going to see that June 30th date get kicked out. I think we'll probably see a third round of funding considering the appetite for the 349 went away with 349 billion went away. The proposed new 250 billion is not going to, is not going to, quench the thirst. So I think we're going to see another round beyond this. Um, when you say June 30th, you mean the expiration of the program? Exactly. I think that date's right. going to get kicked out. I think we're going to see this thing get kicked beyond. I think the eight weeks is still going to matter, and we're going to get into that some more, Joe. I think that eight weeks is absolutely crucial, and people need to really, I'm going to use the word religiously, observe that, um, that eight week period of time. But I think we're going to see with more funding rounds that for second and third layer funding, I'm predicting third layer funding, I'm going to go out on a limb and do that. Um, that June date's going to get changed. Okay. So in so, summary, go ahead. You feel like we will see one, maybe two more rounds of funding, right? Uh, you are hoping that um, the Congress is listening and the Treasury is listening to the feedback that's coming from you and from all over that this is not working well uh, for small businesses in the sense that uh, they may not have had the kind of relationship with the lender they needed to get to the front of the queue. It's been a huge problem for um, churches getting approved. We've right. just heard from so many who uh, put their application in early, it, it thought they were advancing in the queue, and then nothing happened. And yet we hear uh, from other churches who say, gosh, it, it just went through uh, very smoothly. When we talked in, in our very first interview a couple of weeks ago, and, and for those of you that don't know my background, I was a bank CEO prior to, to um, being called into full-time ministry. And so I jumped on this immediately, predicting that what was going to happen is the bank's worst customers were going to get these, uh, the ones most at risk uh, were going to get them. Uh, and I mean, the ones that were putting the bank at risk for default, right. then the bank's best customers, and then lenders, friends, and associates and people, and the squeaky wheels. Uh, and so that seems to be the way it played out. Is that the experience that you're having? That was a lot of what I saw, but I saw two other things. I saw that there were a lot of banks that were complete technology failures. Yes. The other thing that I saw that was very interesting, and this is where everybody in the audience needs to listen in. I saw community banks mm -hmm. and credit unions step up and get stuff done when regional banks were complete train wrecks. And here's my point. Churches are about relationships. Right. 
build the relationships with the people in your own market. You know, let's worry about having relationships in Jerusalem before we start worrying about relationships on the other side of the globe. And in my, my counsel to church leaders, to church board members and so on is if you're banking with one of the big mega banks, rethink that, start moving money over to the community banks, particularly if you've got some deposits that you can leave there, like your building fund that you're growing and so on, put it over in the community banks account. Community banks will benefit so much more from that money being on deposit there than the big mega banks like the Wells and the BOAs and so on. Why? Because that lets these community banks do more business in the community where that church is. That's been our experience. Um, at, it's the same counsel we gave churches when they would call, and that has played itself out. Not perfectly. All community banks didn't do it as well as others. Right. But that the highest success rate that we saw was with community banks. And so I, um, I hear I would, you. That, I hear you exactly saying what build I a relationship. Saw, yeah, me. I saw the same thing. The highest success rate was either at-risk borrowers who already were on some SBA lenders watch list, like, uh Oh, you guys going to be okay. Or we got to make sure we get you more, um, which that's a dangerous place to be for a business. Uh, or I saw it with the churches, the Christian schools, the small businesses that had a relationship with a community bank or credit union. Yeah. So let's summarize this piece. You, um, you're expecting additional funding in the next week or two, uh, ideally uh, the next batch uh, targeted to be around $250 uh, million. Your billion. Billion, billion was sorry. Billion. So it's just hard to say. I know uh, $250 billion. Your counsel is if you are uh, a, a church or a nonprofit uh, and you did not get funded, began a conversation with your lender. And if, if you are not getting assurances that you are uh, toward the front of the line, then seek out uh, a community bank in your community that you can speak to uh, someone and, and be prepared to move deposits if you have to, uh, because that's, you know, it, it's to their advantage to take care of people who will be there uh, will be their customer. So right. encouraging, encouraging, uh, churches to stay with it, even those who have not yet applied to uh, do so following the, the same advice, uh, that $250 billion is still not enough money. So there is a real sense of urgency. If you are passive, you may very well lose out in this round as well. Yep. Fair? Yep, exactly. I agree with, that's a good summary, Joe. That's a very good summary. Well, yep. as many disappointed churches as uh, we've heard from, we, you know, we've heard from hundreds who this has worked out for uh, really well. So That's I'd like to Lord. pivot That's this conversation Lord. to um, what do they need to be doing? Uh, we know that uh, this loan has the potential to be forgivable. Let's start with who is the forgiving authority and mm -hmm. how will uh, churches apply? Wow. All right. I'm going to try to do this without going total nerd. Okay. But the, the forgiving process is buried in a SBA regulatory update. That's about 10 days old. Okay. Um, and it's a real, this, I'm going to try and walk this through and Joe, if I, if I get confusing, just stop me. Okay. The forgiving authority is actually a combination between the lender that made the loan and the treasury. Here's what's going to happen. The, the loan was supposed to be run over an eight week period of time. So on week seven from when the loan is funded by the lender, the lender is supposed to submit a report back to the SBA small business administration with that lender's projection of how much of these loans do they think will qualify for forgiveness. Based upon that information, the SBA will then take 15 days to review that report. And if they like the numbers, if they agree with the projections, that's how much they will quote buy of those loans from the lender. 
So then the bank gets their money from the SBA to replace what they've lent out of their reserves and it wipes out the note, wipes out the loan. Okay. That's how the process is. That's how it's designed to work on the back end. So here's what I am going to count. Here's what I'm counseling my clients. And I've got clients from all realms. I mean, I've given advice to operators of a small Christian school. I've given advice to companies with 80 employees and a massive payroll. So here's what I'm telling them. You've got to be meticulous on your record keeping. And I'm going to go with the strict construction of how the statute's written because there's two competing interpretations of how this can be calculated. I'm going to go with the strictest version, the most conservative version, okay? Um, you need to know some really important things. What's the day that the eight-week clock starts to tick? That's the day you get the money. The day it's deposited into your account. Yes. Uh, 60 days begins. Right. This, that, that, that 56 days begins right then, okay? Eight times seven is 56. So I'm going to see how, see how tight I want to be on this thing, okay? Um, and I'm going, yeah, and eight times eight is 64. So yeah, I see where, but I'm, I'm really want you to have a lot of information to your lender early to help them fill out their projections to give them the best information possible so that they get paid back faster. That's, that's what I'm thinking about here. Mark that first day of the eight weeks and then pay stuff like payroll, rent, utilities that come due during that eight week period of time. So try to match it up that that money comes in and that money is used to cover paychecks that were cut during that eight week period of time for pay owed during that eight week period of time for rent that was due and owing during that eight week period of time for utility bills that were due and owing at that time. And then there's one other calculation that's going to be a little trickier. If you are going to use some of that money for paying on the interest on a debt that was already in place pre-February 15th, 2020, then you need to show how you found out what the interest calculation was. So you need to get a hold of the statement from the lender as to that particular payment and break it down. How much was principal? How much was interest? Was there anything for taxes or insurance? And just that portion that went for interest. Okay. Now somebody's going to come back to me and go, but Jeff, I don't get those kind of statements. Well, then you're going to have to find out where you are in that loan amortization process and run a calculation. And there are these on, there's online calculators to do these things and figure out how much was the interest portion of that payment that came due and owing during that eight week window. Jeff, may I suggest that um, churches, nonprofits that are listening, go to your online version of your statement. Typically those calculations are broken out there. So you can look at that loan and it will show you what the principal and interest on each one of those is real time uh, yeah. and, and just screen print those. Exactly. Print it out and circle the interest portion. Yes. Because you want you want to have you want to be able to submit to that lender between the seventh and eighth week. You want to submit to that lender, hey, here's an itemization of everything that came due during this eight weeks. Not a bill that I owed beforehand, mm -hmm. not an extra bonus in my paychecks. Okay. But here's what came due and here's what I paid during that period of time. Here's what it was. This was the rent. This was the mortgage interest. This was payroll. This was utilities. And now the last thing, and this is the most important thing. Even though the statute, the CARES Act doesn't say it, Treasury has said 75% of the loan proceeds need to go to payroll in order to qualify for forgiveness. Now, if you think about it, and if you do the math, that 75% is a very fair number. Because if you're borrowing two and a half times your, av your average monthly payroll, that's like 
eighty percent, and so you don't even have to use all of that. You can have you got a little bit of a five percent leeway there, so you should be okay. Am I, am I making sense, or did I get too totally? Uh, you're nervous? making sense. Yeah. Okay, because there I have this I have this ability to lapse into lawyer nerd speak. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm following with you, and I'm I'm not that bright, so I think you're okay. Yeah, but you're you've got a good banking and business background, so you know. <laughs> I want to I want to make it clear to the to that pastor, to that church board member that man they're overwhelmed they're struggling okay so maybe you're gonna have to go back and read this a couple of listen to this a couple of times, but you need to have a good tracking system. When did the bill come due? When was the pastor's salary due for the month of April or May or June? And show that you paid what was due for April, May, or June. Now. Joe, you told me you're going to ask me about housing allowance. So let's move to that if you want to. Okay. Cause that's be a before we do, let me okay. just give a, uh, an example of how we're doing at horizons. We got funded in the, in the very first week. Uh, so we have already begun. What we did was created a separate account to put those funds into, and then we reimburse ourselves or we literally are paying out of that fund through, uh, our bill pays the, um, uh, the qualified expenses mm -hmm. and creating a folder in which all that documentation, every time we do it, we put that documentation in there. Uh, we have visited with our uh, CPA to make sure that what we are doing makes sense to them. So we've got another set of, uh, another set of eyes on it and we're building that file as we uh, create those um, expenditures. Yep. That's a great way to do it. That is a great way to do it because then you can track and prove exactly where that money came from and where it went to, to really meet your forgiveness qualifications. Because Joe, from my personal perspective, the forgiveness is the reason I have spent so much time studying this law, you know, right. reading it. I was reading it as they were still drafting it. You know, people were asking me questions about it. I'm going like, they're still writing it be patient, you know, <laughs> I can only read it as fast as they write it. <laughs> well, uh, the, the number one question that we received is who owns the um, business? So we, we've already covered that. Yeah. Uh, it, it, and maybe, maybe we haven't, there's still churches that are having to, uh, to answer that question. Some lenders are leave, allowing churches to leave it blank when they uh, say they're a nonprofit on top. Uh, some of the bigger uh, banks who have automated systems that you have to fill those blocks in, they're putting uh, their, their treasurer uh, or their pastor or someone on that line. Just be sure that whoever you put on that line, it all seems to work fine and go through and they're not accountable for it, but just make sure that they are not someone who has had a default on an SBA loan because that could cause you problems. I think yeah. that's what that uh, is there for uh, exactly. to see if, if this person applying has defaulted before. So just ask that question before you put that on the line. Yep. Uh, and it yeah. doesn't really seem to matter after that who goes in there. The other key thing is whoever you put in that line, make sure that they have signature authority over how that money gets spent. And so I would much rather see that being the treasurer or someone like that for that reason. Yeah. Excellent point. Excellent point. All right. So the second biggest question is what do we do with housing allowance? Uh, did some banks allowed it in the calculation? Some banks didn't allow it in the calculation. Let's talk about, and my recommendation is to try to put it in there. And if the bank allows it, that's great. Uh, if they don't, then uh, you, you're probably stuck unless you can find another uh, lender in a short period of time. But let's assume that it was included in there. On the forgiveness side, uh, I have not seen any clarity around guidance on uh, whether it should be included or not. Jeff, can you, is there something you've discovered that I'm not aware of? That I've discovered? No. I mean, I'm going to crawl out on a limb here and this is, and folks, this is just my best estimation. Okay. We did get clarity that housing allowance should be included. Okay, we did get that clarity from 
Treasury and the SBA. There's been a communication problem coming from, if you got to think about it from this point of view. You've got Treasury at the top, okay? You've got Treasury at the top. You've got the DC SBA right underneath it, and then you've got all these branches underneath that, all these regional SBA offices. The communication problem is going from DC to these regional offices, and there's mixed messages here and there. Mm-hmm. And you've got people that have, well, this is the way we've always done it for 30 years. You know, we've always done it for 30 years this way. Churches have never been able to do it, and so on. Okay, housing, I have no idea what housing allowance is. You know, that's, that's the mindset some of these people are running into. If your loan calculations didn't include it, then you don't have to worry about it. Don't pay it and try and get forgiven for it, okay? Your your ratio should still be good, okay? If you included it in your loan application and it was included in the amount lent, then yes, pay it and show that you paid it because it fits as part of the definition of the compensation regularly paid to that person, okay? Now, the only wrinkle that I can see with this, Joe, is if you're going to find that you're in a larger church that's able to compensate their pastors well, um, where that pastor's getting more than $100,000 a year, the housing allowance may push them over $8,333.33 for a particular month. Well, that's the maximum amount that can be forgiven in that for that period of time. So you're looking at about sixteen six sixty seven, give or take, that can be paid to a pastor, assistant pastor, associate pastor during that eight week period of time. And don't try and get cute and work it around, but that's the max you'll get for that one individual for forgiveness purposes. So how are churches going to go about making application? Uh, you, you spoke about what Treasury is going to do on the projection side, but what is the bank required to, excuse me, what is a church or nonprofit required to do? That is a fantastic question, Joe. And I'm going to tell you that I don't think they've figured that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> I sure okay. haven't seen anything to clarify it. So I I'm glad to hear you uh, I saying I just haven't missed it. I haven't seen a form yet. I haven't seen a draft of a form yet for the borrower to fill out because let's just look at it from this perspective. This CARES Act was enacted a month ago, right? Yes. And the money, the money was gone in three weeks. Mm-hmm. But we don't have to worry about forgiveness for eight weeks. So we've still got time to kick the can down the road. Right, right. I mean, I think they're working more on getting the second round of funding. And then I think they're going to go back and figure out, well, how now do we document the payback? You know, but I'm going to tell you exactly where the burden is going to fall on. The burden is going to fall on the bank to look at it and figure it out. So Mm -hmm. you want to make your banker, your analyst, your clerical person at the bank, you want to make their job as easy as possible. Yes. So that you can give them, here's a summary spreadsheet. Here's all the supporting documentation so they can look at it, run the numbers and go, man, XYZ church did it exactly right. Full forgiveness, you know, lay it out, make it easy for them to follow. And it comes down to being diligent. You know, I mean, how many times in the book of Proverbs are we told when it comes to finances and and money and resources, be diligent. This is another time you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. So what you're imagining is sometime in the near future, because the clock started running, um, we're what, nine days into our funding. So uh, the SBA will create a form and create some guidance and uh, it probably will look something like the lenders had on the front end that they have a requirement to do some reasonable level of due diligence to ensure accuracy before submitting that on for payment. Yep. And what I would do, and this is, this is once again, I'm way out on a limb, folks, way out on a limb. I could be wrong. Okay. And I want to make sure we're clear about this. I could be wrong, but I think you're going to want to have a cover page or a summary showing how much you got on what day, how it got spent, and then sign it at the bottom. Some, the same person who applied, who 
put their name in as the owner on the application process for the church, sign it, the church treasurer sign it. If you use an independent accounting firm, whatever, have them sign it and authenticate the accuracy of that summary and all the supporting documentation. That's going to give that blender when they get it. And hopefully you can get it into them before your eight weeks runs out so that they have a better idea of how much they're going to get reimbursed from the treasury on their money. So let's talk a little bit. Of, you talked about the 75%. You talked about needs to be spent on, um, on payroll, which if you're just making your payroll that you applied for, you should exceed that because it's more like 80%. So you've got some 20% discretionary dollars. That 20% can be spent on rent, interest on existing loan, and utilities that comes due during that window of time. So you've got to demonstrate it, it comes due during that period of time. Right. I get a lot of questions about what constitutes utilities. Yeah, well, the, the SBA's gotten that same question, and they're struggling with it. I expect some clarity and some guidance from them. I think we can stick with the, the known basics, okay? I think we can clearly stick with electricity, telecommunications and internet, heating, you know, whatever, whatever your church uses for heating, is it fuel oil, is it propane, is it natural gas? I think we can use those things. Uh, and water, water and sewer, okay? I think we can cover all of those under the utilities category and be very comfortable there. When it gets to the one issue that's going to be really interesting is leased equipment. Do we, do, are that included or not? I don't think it's included as a utility. I think it's going to be included as rent. I think we're going to get away with being, able, I think we're going to see guidance saying you can include that as rent. Talk to us about the FTE requirements. Uh, part of the calculation was on FTEs. I understand maintaining uh, FTEs is part of the forgiveness equation. Can you speak to that? Right. So they're looking to make sure that you use this money to keep your full-time employees on staff. And that's the purpose of this is to keep people employed. So if you noticed in the application process, they asked you how many employees you had. So when you go to file for your forgiveness, you need to be able to prove or you need to be able to document and substantiate, hey, here's all the pay stubs for the same number of employees that we had when we applied. Now, it gets, for a lot of churches, this is not going to be that complicated. But for a lot of businesses, this could be a real sticky issue. Because you may have some employees that, that just quit. They go away. Um, okay, did you replace them? Please do your best to replace them. But what about those employees for who got, um, who had their pay cut? If their, cut, if their pay was reduced by more than 25%, then that disqualifies that payroll for forgiveness. So you want to show that not only did you keep the same number of employees, but you paid them at least 80% of what they were regularly getting anyhow. And there's, that's where there's a tripwire here, Joe. You got to think about this one because there's a lot of lenders who have told their homeowner borrowers, you show us documentation that you've had a pay cut by 30% or more and we'll do a forbearance. We'll do something on your mortgage. Catch that 30% mm -hmm. versus the 25% in the CARES Act. Right. Mm, there's a lot of things you got to watch out for there. Be careful, okay? Because if you've got somebody coming in and going, hey, you know, hey, brother so-and-so, if the church would put it on, pay, on letterhead that my pay has been reduced by 30%, then I might be able to get three or four payments of my home mortgage kick to the end of the mortgage. And Joe, we could do a whole session on just the traps that are there right. in that. Um, so you've got to be very careful about that, folks. What I'm ideally hoping is that you're paying all of your staff, you're, keeping, you're retaining all of your staff, 
and you're paying them at least 80% of what they used to be making, and you'll be okay. Let's talk about just some practical questions that we're getting asked on this. Um, as I understand it, it's primarily about the FTEs and the total payroll. So if my organist quits, uh, and, and we're not playing the organ right now, but I hire a part-time communication director for uh, in, in that period of time, that switch is okay. The only challenge would be uh, just spending the, the amount of money for qualified expenses. Right. You want to match up the number of, of bodies and mm -hmm. you want to try and match up the amount being paid as close as you can. When churches applied for the loan, they certified that the economic uncertainties warranted the need for this loan. So let's talk about forgiveness in, in different settings. We know that uh, Barna did a study, and, and just speaking with our churches, we know that probably a third to 50% of churches are actually pretty much on track with where they are. Their daycares may have gotten uh, decimated, but if they've really leaned into ministries, uh, they're doing good. We, we have many churches that are at uh, high water marks. I did an interview with a, a church that uh, uh, was over budget in March. To run an over budget in April right now. If they took these funds, can is there a clawback clause uh, for forgivability if, in fact, uh, they found themselves in a better financial position before um, adding those funds to the equation? Great question. There was no clawback language anywhere in the CARES Act for the PPP loan provisions, no clawback whatsoever. The thing is, and you said it, the key word that they had to attest to or certify regarding the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. When we had our first conversation, what, three weeks ago, a little over three weeks ago, so there was massive amount of uncertainty. You and I still know there's so much uncertainty and because I really feel like we're not yet really understanding the full economic impact of shutting down the United States economy and how long it's going to take to relight the engines and get that thing running again. I feel like there is going to be this lingering uncertainty that's going to be impacting the church family for months to come. And yeah, I realize you've got to use the money in eight weeks, but you know what? It's just going to better position that church to continue to reach out and minister. Reach out and minister because everything is not going to go back to the normal that it used to be. We're going to see people sitting further apart from each other when they do start coming back in and sitting in the pews. We're going to see all sorts of awkwardness that's going to happen. And then we're going to see families that are going to be hurting because their employer didn't reopen. Their income is now pretty significantly cut. We're going to see a lot of that. And it's tragic for me to have to say it, but it's coming. And the churches need to be prepared to minister. So let me restate that. So a church that's giving is up, or that may be in possession of large endowments applied for this based on the uncertainty. They find themselves actually in a better financial position in terms of giving. They still qualify for forgiveness because there, there's no test that would say um, that these funds, that you have to be worse off, only that you had a fear that you would be worse off. Uh, so they could invest these funds in, uh, turn around and redistribute these funds through ministry rather than returning them back to government. Well, yeah, in a roundabout way, yes. They're gonna use the specific, specific loan proceeds to cover their normal payroll and other costs, but then the money that has come in that they didn't think was coming in would then be available for extra ministry is the way I would, way I would describe that. And that ministry might be helping out another church, helping out the families, funding a food bank. I mean, I can tell you that in my home church, 
I know the, the leadership of that food bank. They've got more stress on them than ever before. Right. Because it's just getting to that point. The and church I, leaders are going to have to discern God's leading as to how to use those funds if their normal operations didn't warrant them. Do they return the funds to the government or do they invest them, provide them to support payroll in a church who maybe didn't get a loan uh, or to expand ministries or a food bank? That's, that, is, uh, that will be the choice that those leaders will have to discern, hopefully in prayer. Hopefully. Uh, as to how God would have them use those funds, which they now are stewarding uh, and, and re now responsible for the, the impact of. Right. You know, if, you if you remember the first time we talked, I, we talked about, we, we said, listen, churches, you need to take some time. You, leadership, you need to take some time and pray, discern if this is what God wants you to do. If that's what you felt like God was leading you to do, and now God has blessed you, then you know what we have to do. We have to take what we've been blessed with to use it to bless others. It's, it's really that simple, you know? I mean, God gave me an ability to be able to read legislation. I mean, I've done it for 30 years. I've made a good living doing it. God gave me that ability. God gave me the ability to have con multiple contacts and relationships in the banking industry and Capitol Hill and so on. What, do I, what am I supposed to do with that except use it to help other people? That's all, you know? But Jeff, let me have, I've got one closing question. Well, really two, uh, because I'm going to ask you, what didn't we cover that you want to share? But this uh, last closing question has to do with a uh, funding payroll. Uh, if we're in that 60 day period of time, payrolls are not going to fall perfectly based on when you, um, when you receive those funds, but you've got to use them within that eight week period of time. Uh, is it permissible to pre-fund, pre-pay, uh, to use the rest of those funds? Well, let's think this out. Okay, so you've got, you got eight weeks, okay? And the typical month is 4.3 weeks. So really when you have it, you've got two, two months, which is gonna be 8.6 weeks. So you could have that issue if you're paying your staff every month, okay? You could have that issue. I would go ahead and cut the check early. I'd cut the check early, like on the, you know, you've got eight weeks, so you got 64 days. So I'd go ahead and cut the check on the 62nd or the 63rd day, even though it really isn't owing or it really isn't supposed to be paid until like the 72nd day. If you, you know, if you're, if you're gonna, if you're paying once a month to, to your, to your, to your team, your ministers, your payroll, your, your staff, and so on, I'd go ahead and I'd go ahead and cut the check early. Because it's earned and owed at that because point. Because it's earned and owed. Because generally, we're always paying a month behind in that situation. So it's been earned, it's owing, and now it, we're just going to pay it a day or two before it's due, if you know what I mean. It's kind of right. like real estate taxes. They're due and owing. They're always due, but then they're owing a year later. So we're just going to go ahead and pay it early. But Jeff, what haven't we asked that uh, uh, you, you feel would be important to churches, pastors, leaders to hear? You know, I think, I think we're going to see an unprecedented opportunity to minister to people who are really hurting. Hmm. They have a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, anxiety. I think we've got an unprecedented opportunity to do this. And we're going to also find that people are craving some sort of social interaction once we're able to start moving around. And so I think that church leadership should cast a vision for how can they meet that need for hurting people who are craving something. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying cram 200 people into a small room or anything like that for obvious reasons, but figure something out that you can use to reach out to your community. And then the last thing I'm going to tell you is, stay engaged with horizons because as stuff comes out, as new guidance comes out, as this new round of funding comes out, if there's any changes in it, dear pastor, dear church leader, dear board member, 
you're going to learn about it here faster than anywhere else. And you're going to learn about it accurately and reliably here. Because if I get it, I'm obviously going to send it to Joe. Okay. And I've got to tell you, the stuff that Horizons has already collected that I've seen is just cutting edge. I mean, I've only seen one organization that had better resources, and that was the United States White House, you know, that I'm privy to an email from them every now and then as to all the coronavirus information. That's it. So, yeah, that's what I tell you. Stay engaged with Horizons and think about how to minister as we start to come out of this, because there's going to be some amazing opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. For all the listeners, I want you to know Jeff is not compensated to do this. He's compensated to speak all around the country. He is doing this for churches uh, pro bono. Uh, We are grateful. We are appreciative of of your love for the church and your willingness to uh, share and steward the gifts you have and and legislation and and your legal degree with us here. So thank you. God bless you. And uh, we'll probably see you again as more information comes out. That'll be fine. It's a privilege and honor. And I just want to say this. I am so grateful for some of the members of the Horizon team and the impact that they've made in my life and in my church's life. I'm so grateful for that. And a chance to just give something, fine. I'm thrilled to do it. Thanks.